Good evening, and welcome to VCU Health's virtual seminar on the different screening guidelines and options for a variety of cancers, including breast, cervical, colorectal, head and neck, lung, prostate, and skin cancer. My name is Blake Belden, and I'm a member of the marketing and communications team at VCU Massey Cancer Center. Today, we are joined by Dr. Mary Helen Hackney, a medical oncologist at Massey, who will discuss the benefits of cancer screening tests and how detecting cancer early can make it easier to treat or even cure. Before we begin the presentation, uh, I'd like to first note that we'll hold any questions until the end, but feel free to drop um, any questions you do have in the Facebook comments section throughout the event and we'll address them during the Q&A portion at the end. Dr. Hackney is a medical oncologist and the medical director of community oncology at VCU Massey Cancer Center and the VCU School of Medicine. She is a professor and the director of quality improvement in the division of hematology, oncology, and palliative care in the department of internal medicine at the VCU School of Medicine. She attended medical school at East Carolina University School of Medicine and completed her residency and fellowship at VCU. Thank you, Dr. Hackney, for joining us tonight. I'll now turn the show over to you. Excellent. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, so we're gonna talk today about screening for cancer. Um, we know that early detection makes a difference and we've all gotten kind of overwhelmed with COVID right now. So let's think a little bit about what's going on with cancer. Why do we think about detecting cancer early? We know it's the second leading cause of death in the United States, but we know that a lot of cancers are preventable and even better if we catch them early, they can be very highly treatable and very curable. Uh, we know that by doing some of the screening tests that are currently recommended, we can reduce cancer mortality by 35% for some cancers, even more for others. So it's important that even in all the chaos going on right now with COVID, that you think about cancer and your health. We haven't stopped cancer screening just because of COVID. If we think about what cancers are in the US right now, for men, the most common cancer that we see is prostate. They say that one out that 80% of the men at age 80 will have it, whether they know it or not. Lung and lung cancer is probably the, is the most common killer of cancer killer of men. Uh, in women, breast cancer is very common, but the cancer that kills more women is also lung cancer in women. Colorectal uh, comes up third in both men and women. Uh, and then as you see here, some of the other cancers that we're seeing uh, incidents in the United States. Now, one thing that's kind of good is that we are seeing a little bit of a trend downward, and this was recently published by American Cancer Society, that we're seeing both some trend and uh, decrease in overall cancers in the U.S. That may be because some lifestyle issues that we're doing to try to help reduce that chance of getting cancer. Uh, when we look at women, breast cancer still is the most common one, as we saw in that earlier slide. We've had a little bit of increased bump in lung cancer, which we don't like. We'd like to see that decrease. Uh, we're seeing an increase in melanoma and an increase in thyroid cancer. Uh, colorectal cancer uh, incidence is probably decreasing, probably because of more use of colonoscopies. In men, prostate cancer has been the highest incidence, but we're also seeing a decline in that. And fortunately, we're starting to see a decline in both lung cancer and colon cancer. It's just occurrences within men in the US. Now, I talk about all this cancer happening. On the good side, you gotta look at this. This is the characteristics of cancer survivors. And right now we're somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 to probably closer to 18 million cancer survivors in the US right now. And this is what we're looking for. We're looking for more people living uh, healthy lives and living a long time after a cancer diagnosis. So this is our positive finding after looking at all those other numbers. Cancer, more survivors, and this is really more survivors in all age group. You see that number is continuing to rise. Let's put it another way. If you live to age 90 and you're a male, one out of two of you are going to have a personal history of cancer. If you live to age 90 and you're a female, 
one out of three of you are going to have a personal history of cancer. It does not mean you die of cancer because the key is cancer does not equal death. It just means that you have had to walk that battle, walk that journey. Now we're going to talk a little bit about screening today. And so screening, there are really three definitions of screening. Uh, one definition of screening is primary screening. That means removing the risk factors for cancer, trying to prevent ever getting cancer. We'll talk about that later uh, in the presentation. The other uh, cancer uh, screening, the one we tend to think about most is what they call secondary screening. And the guide is to look for early detection. And by early detection, we hope that we're then going to be able to better be able to uh, treat the cancer or maybe even catch it in a pre-malignant or pre-invasive state where it's less likely to cause problems in the future. The third thing we're going to talk about just very briefly is what they call tertiary screening. And this really applies to people who've already had a diagnosis of cancer. And we're looking then at survivorship and how do they follow what rules do they follow after a cancer diagnosis for additional testing or screening for a recurrence of their specific cancer? Now, remember, just because you've had one cancer doesn't mean you can ignore screening for the other cancers uh, that are out there. So you have to think globally about your health. Uh, we're going to do a little teaching here, something I do with the medical students. If you think about a screening test, why do you do a screening test? You want to find the cancer early so that you can reduce the burden on our public health department. You want to catch it when it's not symptomatic. You want to catch it when it's potentially curable or better treatable. You need a test that's relatively low cost and that's acceptable to do. Uh, you can't have a test that you want to do, quote, let's say every six months. But if it costs $1,000 every six months to do a test to screen for let's say pancreatic cancer, that's not going to be feasible for so many reasons, cost, uh, burden, uh, acceptable to be doing. So you've got to have a test that is reasonable to do. And you've got, you really want a screening test that's going to make people live longer. And we get these recommendations about how we screen for these things uh, from a variety of ways. There is uh, evidence based uh, from research where they're looking at survivorship. We collect all types of cancer statistics. We put them into various data banks and there are people with great minds who go through them and analyze them. Uh, when that's how we realize that mammograms uh, have a great impact in reducing breast cancer mortality in women between 50 and 70. We look for equivalence. We look for incidence and we look for um, uh, how often these cancers occur. And we look for similar characteristics of the people who get cancer. This is one reason we have tumor registries that collect a lot of this data. Uh, they're also what they call consensus panels. You may have heard of something called the United States Preventive Services Task Force. And this is a group of people who look at data and try to come up with recommendations that they can apply to the whole population. Uh, and there are oftentimes studies out there and people, there are oftentimes math models that might help people determine what might be a useful screening test. Uh, what I mentioned earlier, the Preventative Services Task Force, what they are, they're primary care physicians, public health uh, officials from all types of areas. And they the goal is that they will look at the data with the absence of cancer bias. Um, sometimes we all, as cancer doctors, sometimes we don't always agree with what they're saying because we're seeing it purely from the cancer perspective. But their goal is to try to look at data and give the best uh, commentary of how to use test and uh, for early detection of cancer. That's really what we're looking for. Now the again, as part of a teaching point, what you want is a good test that's going to lead to a diagnosis that's going to make you live longer. There can be a poor test that's not good for looking for cancer, uh, and it doesn't improve your mortality. Or there can be no screening, and you still develop a cancer, and it still leads to end of life. So often the challenge we often have is trying to figure out how often to do a test and what is that best test. 
And so when you think of lead time is, you know, is there improvement in survival? If you detect it at, let's say, one centimeter versus five centimeters, is there a difference in how you treat a cancer? Um, and can you actually find the cancer with a screening tool? Uh, and so uh, there are experts who try to help come up with these guidelines. And if you think about it, we look at colon cancer, we screen every 10 years because of the way colon cancer works. We look at breast cancer, we screen yearly or every other year. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Again, because of how it, fast it grows. Uh, with uh, pap smears, we used to do them once a year, but additional research is now saying five years. So again, this is where you're sort of thinking about when does the benefit of the test and what is the time frame that gives us that best benefit? So this is what we call, remember I mentioned earlier, something about tertiary screening, okay? And so if somebody has already had a cancer diagnosis, they are gonna be going through certain testing after their cancer diagnosis. And it varies a lot depending on the type of cancer. Uh, so uh, some cancers such as breast cancer do not have any regular screening after diagnosis except for breast imaging uh, mammograms. Uh, some cancers like lung cancer have uh, CT scans at regular intervals, oftentimes three month intervals due to the uh, nature of the cancer. So it's very based on uh, the disease and based on the stage of presentation. One of the best resources I can point to uh, for people is at uh, www.cancer.net. That comes from our national oncology organization. It's called the American Society of Clinical Oncology. I think I did leave a word out here, ASCO. And they have guidelines uh, published on all a variety of different cancers. They're a great resource to look for actually treatment of cancer as well. But you know, how do you follow a patient after a diagnosis? And so I highly recommend the www.cancer.net as a great resource uh, to look at how do you follow somebody? What are the questions you do when you uh, uh, ask your physician about how you need to go forward uh, with your um, care and screening after a diagnosis? So this is tertiary screening. What we'd like to do though, is to focus a little bit more on screening for cancers before they become a problem or screen informed so we can catch them early and be able to intervene and keep them from becoming a problem. So we're going back to what we said in that earlier slide called secondary screening, okay? So let's get ready for that piece. And let me take a sip here. Okay, so if we screen for cancers, we know some things do make a difference, okay? Yes. Who do we screen for? We screen for breast cancer. We know we can impact mortality and morbidity on that. Yes, we screen for colon and rectal cancer. If you remember one of those slides, mortality is dropping from colon cancer because we're detecting more of it uh, or detecting it at earlier stages so we have less death, less incidences. Cervical cancer, uh, women's cervix. This is a cancer we know that regular screening, we can impact mortality and the complications of the cancer. Increasingly, we're now screening for lung cancer. So we know that is one that we can also impact mortality on. So yes, these are ones that we screen for in the appropriate people. How about our maybe column? A Little bit different here. Prostate cancer. Now you, everybody's gonna go to me and say, why? We should be screening for prostate cancer. There's actually quite a bit of controversy about prostate cancer and screening. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, skin cancer. There are a lot of people who get regular scans, uh, regular skin checks. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Head and neck cancer um, or oropharyngeal cancer. Screening for that is also a little bit complicated, but it is available. Ovarian cancer probably the only group who really needs ovarian cancer screening are people who carry a known genetics uh, and people who carry the BRCA gene, 
are people who should be screened for uh, ovarian cancer. And so that's a very small number. Pancreatic cancer, also we wonder with people who have certain genetic mutations in their family, uh, probably should be screened, but we don't know the best test yet. And that's one of our scariest cancers. Uh, but there are many groups who are trying to come up with a good test. Uh, the, a couple other things I did not include on this slide, but I'll talk about them just briefly here. There are some people who have liver disease that will be screened for developing liver cancer using a test called alpha fetoprotein. It's a very small number of patients, but uh, patients who are being followed for some severe uh, disorders of the liver, some severe, severe, severe cirrhosis, uh, may be screened for liver cancer with the test, a blood test, alpha fetoprotein. So that's one situation where uh, there may be a blood test, uh, but again, a very narrow group. You just don't go and do that with everybody walking around. Uh, and uh, as I said, similarly, uh, the uh, CA125 for ovarian cancer, again, used in a very narrow window of patients. Uh, other screening for cancers, we don't have some good ideas. We tell people, be aware of your body and know what your body feels like. Uh, so let's think about how do we early detect age. More cancers happen as we get older. So we need to be aware of changes in our body. If we find lumps, bumps, changes, we're feeling unwell. I will often tell patients, if you feel like you're not at ease, dis-ease in your body, then talk with your physician. Habits, do you put yourself at increased risk for getting cancer? And so that's another key factor. If you put yourself at risk for getting cancer, can you break some of those habits? Do you know your family history? Some cancers are correlated with family history or genetic mutations. So screening guidelines may vary differently. If you have a strong family history of colorectal cancer in your family, you may start your screening in your 30s rather than in your 40s. Uh, so know your family history and don't be afraid to share your history uh, with your family members. Uh, it can help save lives. Um, everybody's looking for that perfect test. Man, it'd be lovely if we had a blood test or an x-ray or something like we see in the futuristics where you can just screen down and know if something's wrong. Uh, we don't have that yet. Uh, there are certainly companies that are out there looking at whether or not we can find either circulating tumor cells, circulating cancer cells, or other evidence of cancer in the bloodstream. And there may be certain situations where that'll be useful, but right now it's not to be done in just a routine, here's a healthy person, let's draw this blood test yet. Uh, maybe one of these days we'll get there. Um, there is always hope and there's always hope through research. That's why we have clinical trials. That's why we have all types of research ongoing uh, throughout the U.S. and right here at Massey Cancer Center as well. So let's think about cancers and let's think about what we can do. Lung cancer, it is still the biggest killer, cancer killer of men and women in the U.S. And so we think about all those others, but lung cancer kills more people. And it used to be that, you know, you just tried to stop smoking. They've talked about trying to do tests where you spit into a cup and you looked at the spit to see if you saw cancer cells. They tried doing yearly chest x-rays and they didn't find that they picked up cancer early enough that a patient could have either surgery or radiation and really make a big difference in how they were uh, going to survive. However, more and more studies, there's several studies out there. And one was a big screening trial that was done, oh, almost 10 years ago now. But it looked at what they call a low dose CT scan of the chest. So where you go into a machine, you take what's called a CAT scan. You don't have to have any dye or anything injected. It takes uh, less than 15 minutes but they take pictures of the lungs and they can see behind the bones, behind the breastbone, see the lymph nodes. And they did this test in people who had a significant smoking history. So you either had to still be smoking or be within 15 years of stopping. Uh, in the age roughly 50 to 75. And they found that if they did this test on a regular basis, they were able to pick up lung cancers at an early enough stage that 
such as stage one or early stage two that were resectable or treatable with radiation. And these patients had a decreased death from lung cancer. More often without screening, we're seeing patients present with stage three and stage four lung cancer, which is a lot more difficult to manage. So here is some, you know, here's a new test out there that is it's an old test in a new way that is really improving uh, patients, uh, reducing their chance of dying of lung cancer. So if you've ever smoked or if you're still smoking, then it's worthwhile talking to your physician about should you go for lung cancer screening. Now, the Europeans use three years. In the U.S., we're using a year. Uh, the cost of the scans are now included in by insurance. It is a standard test nowadays. Um, there's always a small risk that you might see some scar tissue or something that might uh, make you make the physician nervous, might not be cancer. Uh, but finding the cancer is uh, certainly the key goal of these testing. Uh, there are guidelines uh, very similar to what I said earlier. We're looking for people in their 50s, 60s, and 70s who have had a significant smoking history and or are continuing to smoke. And the way we work with it at VCU Health System and Massey Cancer Center is that we have a lung cancer screening clinic. And you get your scan done, you meet with a pulmonologist to review the results, uh, because sometimes we pick up other issues on the lung, on the scan about the lungs. Uh, and there's also, you get your results, hopefully, usually the same day. It's all combined in one, one setting. Uh, and there's also the opportunity for discussion about smoking cessation. And we have two teams of people who are actively working with patients, men and women, <coughs> excuse me, about smoking cessation, because that's still a key to improving uh, quality of life. So I said, no smoke. There is no good tobacco. So that's lung cancer. So the right people need to go out there. Ovarian cancer. The challenge with ovarian cancer sometimes is that it's a very quiet disease. We don't always know when it happens. Uh, and every so often there is somebody who gets on the news or the blog or the websites and says, all women need to have a CA-125 blood test uh, as a screening tool for ovarian cancer. We are not, it is not a perfect test to screen for ovarian cancer, but it is a test that is available in women who have high risk uh, so that they may, uh, uh, they combined with an ultrasound, may be able to detect ovarian cancer early. Again, remember I mentioned know your family history. So it's important to know your family history so that if you see that high risk that you talk with your gynecologist, do you need to be screened for ovarian cancer? Uh, it, it's usually in combination, as I said, with an ultrasound. And the challenge with it also is it can go up with other things. It can go up with any inflammation in the belly. And so sometimes people will have an elevated can 125 and they, oh my gosh, I have ovarian cancer. And then it turns out it's due to uh, inflammatory bowel disease or diverticulitis or something. So that's why it has to be put in the right context. So key, know your history here. Cervical cancer. Outside of the US, this is one of the biggest cancer killers. Because we have access to pap smears and HPV testing, we're seeing fewer people dying of cervical cancer. Uh, and HPV, human papillomavirus. This is a virus that we know uh, can uh, lead to cervical cancer. We know it can be prevented by vaccination during the teen years. So we encourage people to uh, have their teenagers vaccinated. Uh, by It can help prevent developing this cancer. Uh, so what they're doing increasingly is using HPV screening instead of pap smears uh, as part of the look, uh, testing for cervical cancer. And just to show you that things do change, as I said earlier, things will evolve. The column we're most interested in here is the left-hand column where it says 2020 American Cancer Society. 
who needs to be screened for cervical cancer. They are suggesting that if you're between 21 and 24, you don't need any screening. But when you start uh, get into your mid 20s to 30s, that you should have an HPV test done as part of a, uh, a gynecological exam, uh, or that you should have an HPV and a pap test as a combined exam. Uh, and you do this every five years. Okay, many of us are used to having this done yearly. So this is an evolution in thought as they look at uh, what puts people at risk and uh, how often do you detect cancer? How long is it the natural history of the cancer to happen? Uh, a pap smear every three years is another way to do this. The pap smear being a vaginal exam with a sampling of the cervix with a special instrument and looking at that under the microscope. Uh, again, at age 30 to 65, uh, the tests are every five years, every three years. And then when you get to age 65, if you've had normal tests in the past, you haven't had any um, abnormal pap smears, or you haven't uh, had um, the presence of HPV, then you can probably stop doing uh, the GYN, the part of this gynecological exam. Uh, and it's very different from how most of many people, many women have been led over the past uh, decades. So this is really a key thing to talk with your gynecologist or your primary care physician as to where you fall uh, looking at the current information. But uh, HPV and pap smears are both done to help early detection of uh, cervical cancer and uh, atypical changes that might uh, lead to cancer in the future. The other cancer that we know that screening really makes a difference. So we've talked about lung cancer. We've talked about um, cervical cancer. We know that breast cancer screening is always a hot topic. People are always involved in breast cancer. Uh, lots of pink ribbons everywhere. Uh, but there are a lot of screening guidelines out there and there's been even some debate about when people should start screening. Uh, we know that people who have a family history of uh, breast cancer, people who might have had previous biopsies might be uh, evaluated at different intervals. And we know that people who've actually had breast cancer might have different uh, modalities offered to them after the diagnosis. So the standard for how we uh, screen right now is mammography. It has been for many years. Almost everywhere uh, in the, at least in the United States right now, we're using digital mammography rather than the old plain film mammography. And that actually gives a little bit different picture. It also makes the images much more uh, transmissible to other doctors to look at if necessary. What we're seeing uh, on the horizon right now is what they call 3D mammography or tomosynthesis. tomosynthesis. Can hardly say that sometimes. 3D mammography, uh, the same process of two views of, I, I will tell you, pulling and squashing the breast, but it uses a slightly different uh, way of imaging. And particularly for women with dense breasts, it gives a little bit better view through the breast. So increasingly you're seeing 3D mammography offered. Uh, and so if it is available, I would certainly uh, take advantage of it. Uh, right now, there's no indication that anybody needs a routine ultrasound as part of their mammography. Uh, if somebody is in their 20s and they have a lump, oftentimes ultrasound is the first choice to evaluate a lump, someone in their 20s, but certainly somebody in their 20s can also get a mammogram if that's appropriate. Uh, there's also very few women who need routine MRIs in the absence of symptoms, uh, in the absence of a history of cancer. So a uh, screening MRI or magnetic resonance imaging really should only be reserved for people who have a strong family history or because of other particulars of a cancer diagnosis. So screening digital mammography, preferably 3D if available, is still our standard or is our standard. Now, this is where things get kind of goofy sometimes because people start reading 
different information. Um, I just lost my slides. Did somebody else lose my slides? Well, wonder what has happened here. Okay. Um, it says it's still sharing. I apologize, everybody, for a technical glitch here. Uh, let's see. My apologies. What has happened? Can Jorge, can you hear me? Jorge, George, can you hear me? Can you reshare your screen again? Is it saying um, you, you are sharing? I says my I says I am sharing. All of a sudden, I was looking at my dogs. My apologies, everybody. Is there a reshare option? I. Hey, Doctor Hackney, I um, I just jumped in here. Um, it looks like it, it. Your your screen was shared, but your PowerPoint went down. So we could see your screen. We saw your screensaver there. Um, okay. Yeah, I did have a screensaver there. Okay, there's the PowerPoint. Can you see that? We don't see it on my side yet. Okay. Okay, now I see you. Okay. Let's try um, share. Okay, I see your screen. Yep, okay. and if you if you make that full screen, we'll we'll and start it at the slide you were at. Okay, so just hit slideshow. Mhm. Mm and I'll wait until you get to the slide where you were at. Okay. All right, uh, Blake. I'm going to pull you off. Okay. You tell me, tell me where you are. Okay. okay. And just start it from there. Okay, I'm, I'm almost there. There we go. That's where it was. All right, start it from there and I'll bring it up okay, to the so screen. So we just hit slideshow here? Yep. Current slide, there we go. Okay, are we back in business, everybody? Okay, sorry about that. I'm not sure what all happened there, guys. Well, welcome back here. So we're talking about breast cancer and recommendations. Um, are a little bit different these days. And uh, this is where there's been controversy and it drives everybody a little bit crazy. But um, the majority of groups, the American Cancer um, American uh, Society of Clinical Oncology, of which I am a clinical oncologist, American College of Radiology, uh, and quite a few other groups recommend that we start mammograms in women, at a average risk women at age 40. Uh, recently, the American Cancer Society said start at age 45, but they said at age 40, you can start having a discussion uh, with the women about should they start at age 40, and you do it yearly. Uh, and you do it yearly till somebody really doesn't care if they want to get a mammogram or not. Uh, if you see my little caveat on the corner here, it says stop mammograms when an individual would not act on results. So there's not an exact age. Uh, there have been some groups that suggest that you stop at age 75. Uh, but as we all know, our population is continuing to age. And there's some women who are in their 70s, maybe even their early 80s, who if they found a cancer would still want to have intervention. And so uh, we really have to look at where they are functionally, not just at the number for when you stop doing your imaging. 
uh, clinical breast exams by a medical provider uh, suggested at every three years uh, in your 20s and 30s. And when you're in your 40s, then you uh, su suggest it every year. Uh, now, again, this has a little bit of controversy in terms of how, um, uh, how often uh, somebody should see a physician because many people in their 40s are not seeing a physician uh, very frequently. It was always linked previously to the pap smears, but we're not doing those yearly anymore. So that leads to sort of being aware of your body. Uh, it used to be, many of us used to have a little card hanging in our shower that said, do your breast exam monthly. And that's actually been taken off of the guidelines. And the current guideline is know your body. So be aware of your body, be aware of lumps and bumps, uh, and know if there are changes going on in your breast. And if you see changes, bring them to the attention of a medical provider. Now, the United States Preventive Services Task Force that I mentioned earlier in the talk has suggested that we wait till age 50 to start mammograms. Uh, and they're thinking that maybe even every other year is sufficient. They're concerned that there are too many extra biopsies being done or too much fear of patients getting uh, these extra biopsies. And so with that, there people are going, I will tell you, it's raised a lot of discussion, but many uh, cancer-based physicians are going back and saying, no, there's actually some good mortality data between ages 40 and 50. So start at age 40. If you have a family history, this is why you need to know it. You may start in your 30s uh, and you may add an MRI as part of routine screening. So one of the concerns for why people were looking at maybe doing fewer mammograms is that we're now catching these tiny, tiny tumors, two millimeters, three millimeters, five millimeters. And we're then putting people through surgery and it's oftentimes radiation. Uh, are we over treating these cancers? Are we giving people surgeries that if they waited another year or so, the mortality, their death rate from cancer would still be the same, but less uh, intervention. So that is where there's uh, discussion. Most of us, when we hear the word cancer say, hey, we want it gone. Uh, so we're continuing to try to find the right uh, point here. Again, I still support for starting at age 40, going yearly, and then uh, when you reach an age that intervention is not appropriate, then you stop. The best data, the group of people who get the best benefit from mammograms probably is that 50 to 70 year old age group. The average age for a woman to get breast cancer in the U.S. is 62, median age is 62 rather. So that's the group that gets the best uh, benefit. And get a mammogram. In the time of COVID, we've had a little bit of challenges with mammograms because we know that if you have your shot on one arm, the lymph nodes in that arm may swell a little bit for up to a couple of months after your COVID vaccine. Uh, and that can show up on your mammogram. So the one thing we are recommending now is that if you've had a COVID vaccine, is that you wait uh, so, uh, several weeks, up to two months before you get your mammogram so that we don't see that uh, swollen lymph node and then put everybody in a bit of a tizzy. Uh, there's all these, uh, there is always politics around breast cancer. There's a lot of fear around breast cancer, uh, but know that we still have fewer women dying of it uh, because we are catching it earlier. Uh, we see breast MRI out there as a tool. It is to be used uh, in very specific areas, particularly super dense breast or strong family history or screening uh, prior to surgery at times but it's not to be used in the average risk woman uh, walking around the street right now. The mammogram is still your best tool. Colon cancer screening. Um, you notice we've got all our different ribbons popping up all over the place here. Uh, mortality from colon cancer is reduced by screening because if you can catch colon cancer early or you catch it in, before it even develops as a polyp in the colon, before it turns into a cancer, then you have less risk of dying of it. Uh, it's a very under, the screening tests are very underutilized. 
And in areas where there's limited access to care, particularly some areas of uh, rural areas, including rural areas of Virginia, uh, lack of access to these colon cancer screening uh, tools has sh has led to an increase of colon cancer incidents. So we really are work they're working very hard to figure out how to get colon cancer screening to everybody. And this and there's been some changes. For many years, it was start at age 50 and do it every 10 years until 75 or so. That has been the standard. However, just this past year, American Cancer Society published new guidelines. It came out in November of 2020 that to start screening average risk people at age 45. It said, discuss with your doctor what's your best testing method. And I'll tell you that colonoscopy is still the best, the gold standard by which everything is judged against. With colonoscopy, if they see a precancerous lesion, they can remove it. And so it allows you both to look for cancer as well as precancerous lesions. But they're now suggesting start at age 45. So some, something new. Um, and this is just a short sum of what ACS said. Start regular screening at age 45 with a test that looks at your stool or, or a visual a visual test such as colonoscopy. Uh, hopefully they should be, uh, if you have a long life expectancy, you're going to live more than 10 years. You can continue to do this every five to 10 years, depending on your test results, till you get to age 75. And then for people 76 through 85, only if they are, it depends on what the health issues are, and it depends on the history as to whether any screening should be done. And if you're over 85, probably no longer a reason to do colon cancer screening. But at least we do have some tests that are less invasive now. If you have first degree relatives uh, with colon cancer, particularly if they were diagnosed under age 60, two or more relatives, then you're actually going to start at a younger age. Uh, so you may start in your 20s and 30s. If you have a family history of polyposis, or if you have guidelines for specific, uh, there are specific guidelines for how often uh, people will get screened. People with ulcerative colitis, certain other inflammatory bowel diseases may get screened more frequently. So again, that is working with uh, your uh, physicians to know what your history is and uh, which guidelines to follow. Uh, many people who have some of the uh, inflammatory bowel diseases are getting screened on a once a year or up to every three year uh, time frame. Now, how do we find cancer? Uh, there are a couple of things out there. There are this gold standard, uh, which has a little blue star in it, is the colonoscopy. As I said earlier, you're going to be able to find polyps. You're going to be able to find early cancer. You're going to be able to remove them. Flexible sigmoidoscope doesn't get as far up into the colon, uh, but it does uh, work as a good screening tool and it can also remove polyps. Uh, we, I can't remember the last time anybody's done a barium enema, but it is out there. Uh, and you'll often hear about CT colonography as a way to look for polyps and cancer. Now recognize that CT colonography or what they call a virtual colonoscopy you still have to do the same prep. So if it's your worry about the prep keeping you from getting your colon cancer, even if you did it virtually, you still have to do that same clean everything out, okay? And that's usually the thing that worries people the most about colon cancer. Believe it, you know, if you have to only do something once every five or 10 years, you should be able to manage it, okay? Um, there are multiple other tests out there. There is the fecal occult blood test, which has been around for years. It is done yearly, has a lot of things that can make it abnormal. Uh, there's something called the FIT test. There's stool DNA. Uh, there's a number of tests being advertised on TV. So all of these tests uh, help find early colon cancer by looking for evidence of DNA or colon cancer cells in samples. Um, but they can't get rid of this. If you find those, if they're turned positive,
then you have to go back and do your colonoscopy. Also, when you use the stool test, you're going to be doing those on uh, a regular basis, like a yearly basis. Uh, they, we do a colonoscopy, you're doing it on a, every five or 10 year basis. So different tests have different needs. Some people who can't tolerate anesthesia may find it's better to do the stool testing. Uh, some people who just want to have everything done, one and done, colonoscopy will give you the best uh, look and uh, intervention at the same time. Uh, so again, we now have some opportunities uh, to uh, look for colon cancer early. Uh, the best test is again, the colonoscopy because that finds it at the earliest stages and even precancerous stages. Prostate cancer, let's see how we're doing on our time. Yeah, prostate cancer, controversial. I don't know what else to say, except it is. Uh, the best uh, exam uh, for prostate cancer is a digital rectal exam. Uh, and uh, you can find uh, the lumps in the uh, prostate through that. The prostate specific antigen is out there and certainly people are concerned that uh, it should be used as a screening tool and that every man should get a PSA, a, P a prostate specific antigen test done on a regular basis. We know there's a high risk of men developing prostate cancer, as I said earlier in the talk, uh, by age 80. Um, or, you know, as they age, there's a high risk they will develop it. But many men will be asymptomatic with it. And so the question that has been raised is if you have an elevated PSA and you find an early uh, prostate cancer, um, is the treatment needed to make the, pay the gentleman live longer? And so this is where there has been a great deal of controversy in how the PSA should be utilized. By itself, the PSA, the, the test, it's a blood test, is not diagnosis of cancer because it can go up with some non-cancerous conditions such as prostatitis or infection of the prostate. Um, it is a screening tool only if you're asymptomatic. The, excuse me, the thoughts are that if you're having symptoms, then you need actually a diagnostic tool uh, to determine if you have cancer or not. Uh, there's not been a lot of studies about PSAs in minority groups. And, you know, when you look at some of the guidelines, they may not uh, apply to some of our minority populations. They don't really apply to people who have a strong family history of prostate cancer because we are seeing prostate cancer uh, in our hereditary cancer group. So the worry is that, okay, we have a PSA done yearly on men. It goes up. Are they going to get testing done? Are they going to get biopsies done? May they even get treated? And are they going to have complications such as incontinence, erectile dysfunction, and such from treating prostate cancer? But it may have been a cancer so small, it might not have impacted mortality. Uh, and this is where the challenges become of doing a screening test. This is probably one of the more controversial ones. Uh, so the most recent guidelines that I could find published, although there are continuing discussions, uh, so that if somebody is elderly uh, or has uh, other comorbid conditions, to not do a routine prostate-specific antigen. If you have greater than 10 years of life living, then the physician and patient need to discuss pros and cons of testing and how you're going to follow it. If you have an elevated prostate-specific antigen, PSA, are you going to uh, do a biopsy? It should all, if you have an elevated one, you should have a digital exam. And uh, there's a lot of what they call watchful waiting with some of the PSA levels uh, to decide when to make that next step. If you look at the preventative task services that you know, we've talked about earlier, they don't think anybody in the absence of symptoms should have a PSA. No one should have it. That you are, for lack of a better word, looking, looking for something to intervene on that may not need intervention. If somebody has symptoms, they're having problems uh, with their urinary stream, uh, then uh, they're having any discomfort uh, with voiding, 
then that's uh, having trouble getting their stream started. Then they should be evaluated for what's going on with their prostate. So again, with prostate cancer, it's controversial. It really, as they say, goes back to talking with your physician uh, about uh, what to do with that test. Uh, there are certain physicians who do it yearly, no matter what, in all men. Uh, but again, what do you do if the result is abnormal? Head and neck cancer, oral pharyngeal cancer. Uh, we're seeing a number of these cancers. Originally, they all seem to be associated with tobacco use. Increasingly, we're seeing HPV virus, the human papilloma virus, same virus that we see with cervical cancer uh, as a risk factor for head and neck cancer. Uh, their screening uh, oftentimes is done in the dental office, uh, looking in the mouth and the oropharynx for changes uh, that uh, need to be evaluated by an ear, nose, throat surgeon or by an oral surgeon. Uh, occasionally, people will run special events that will do a mouth screen to look uh, throughout the mouth, look in the, uh, the back of the throat uh, to look for cancers. Uh, so the key thing I would say here is don't smoke. Uh, tobacco is still our big thing. And then hopefully, um, as we see the increased use of HPV vaccine, uh, maybe we will see less of HPV associated cancers. Skin cancer. I would expect that many people watching this event have had a dermatologist examine them head to toe for skin cancers. I hate to tell you, but no one has found that that makes you live longer. What it does do is that it does help uh, catch cancers early before they create a lot of damage so that you can have them resected or frozen off or otherwise removed. Uh, those are mostly your squamous cell cancers and your basal cell cancers. That's the red and white uh, ribbon on this slide. Uh, there are uh, the one thing that we do see with some of the skin uh, surveys is that we may detect melanomas at earlier stage and that is the black ribbon here is melanoma but it still has been hard to correlate a yearly exam with improved um, uh, reduction in death from melanoma again this is when you need to know your body if you start to see a mole changing something looks different it's a different color it's bleeding it's uh dark, then that is seek care with a dermatologist, have it properly evaluated. So again, know what your body looks like, know what it feels like. Best prevention for skin cancers is limiting your sun exposure. Use your sun blocking agents, be it lotions, be it clothing, is that be it proper hats. Uh, if people uh, protect their skin, they're much less likely uh, to get uh, the squamous and basal cell skin cancers. Melanoma is associated with sun, but oftentimes melanoma is in areas of the body where that does not have sunshine. So it is not um, only a sun cancer. It is um, a cancer that can show up in many other ways. Now, you know, so we've talked a little bit about screening here. You've hit some of the highlights of cancers that we know we can impact a little bit by taking care of our bodies. Uh, or by looking at our bodies, by getting them examined properly. Now, let's say we don't want to get cancer in the beginning. That's a hard thing to do, okay? Uh, we know cancer is, a we're all getting older and cancer comes with getting older, but we also know that lifestyle can make a difference. So wellness uh, is important in terms of helping reduce the chance of you getting cancer. And that means good nutrition, uh, good fitness, that means getting health care, getting your colonoscopy, getting your mammogram, uh, getting your pap smears done when it's appropriate. Um, and, you know, having that good positive lifestyle does make a difference. Um, things that we know make a difference. No tobacco. There is nothing good. Obesity, appropriate body weight. We know that people who carry more weight uh, have uh, more risk of endometrial cancer, breast cancer, uh, uh, some other cancers as well. Alcohol consumption, uh, we'll talk a bit more about that, can also increase uh, risk of cancer. HPV vaccine, get it as a teenager. There is chemo prevention for breast cancer that high risk people can be 
uh, can be evaluated for. And in some very limited situations, uh, people may have what they call prophylactic surgery uh, to reduce the risk of ovarian or, pro or breast cancer. There are a lot of things out there that are touted to, to help reduce cancer risk. Well, I wish we had some great data on them. We're still gathering information. A big, a large number of these are anti-inflammatory type uh, agents, turmeric and its components, um, other inflammatory drugs, even the statins that we use to help fight cholesterol are being looked at as a possible um, anti-cancer or drug or contributing to reducing inflammation and cancer. There are specialized diets, there's specialized supplements, there's shifting acid base, there's organic only, there's no sugar diets. The best diet is a good healthy diet, which is fruits, grains, vegetables, uh, healthy proteins combined with exercise. So a lot of people are touting a lot of things, but really it boils down to some very simple good health. Um, tobacco use, I'll just make another comment. I've hit it a couple of times during this talk. Um, there is no good tobacco. Uh, hookah, smokeless tobacco, cigars, all have cancer potential. And we're actually seeing worrying that uh, with some of the hookah uh, that we may see um, some people are getting actually an increase of the toxins in their system. Uh, and it's not just lung cancer, it's bladder cancer, esophageal cancer, head and neck, cancer of the cervix, pancreas, colon, kidney. So there are multiple cancers that tobacco use can impact. So no tobacco. Alcohol consumption. Um, all alcoholic beverages have a risk. One, uh, one beer is equal to a shot of whiskey, which is equal to a glass of wine. Uh, there, men and women have a little bit different tolerance, but less alcohol is better. And we know that alcohol consumption, uh, overconsumption, is, uh, can lead to increased risk of pancreas, breast, head, neck, liver, esophagus cancers. Uh, so limit alcohol consumption. Uh, again, when we go back to it, all of these things are interact. Our bodies interact with DNA repair, hormones, inflammation, immunity, it's food, it's nutrition, it's obesity, physical activity. All these things interact that might, if there's a disruption, may lead to cancer. There's no one thing that makes cancer happen. If there was, then I'd be out of a job, which would be fine. We could turn, stop having cancer. Uh, but we know we can best help reduce our risk by taking care of our bodies. So lead a healthy lifestyle, know your family history, Work with your primary care doctor to determine what's your best timing for screening test. And when you get stuck of what to do, go look at the American Cancer Society, American Society of Clinical Oncology. They've got great discussions about the guidelines, who needs what, who needs what, when. And uh, put that into your routine so that you can uh, hopefully live a long and healthy life and go forward with uh, what all is happening in the world. So thank you. Sorry for the interruption in the middle and uh, time for questions and we can go from there. Great, well, thank you uh, so much for that informative presentation, Dr. Hackney. Yeah, let's um, go ahead and just move to some of these questions we have. Okay. Um, so from Facebook, we have our expanded genetic panels that include transcriptome profiles, a viable way to identify subtypes of cancers? So there's a number of, there's, there's genetics of the cancer and there's genomic profiles. So um, with some uh, cancers, we are able to do testing that we can find mutations that might give us uh, clues to what drugs might work against that particular cancer. So that is the genomics of the cancer. There's genetics, which means inherited genes, ones that you pass on in your germ, your germline mutations. Uh, those are ones that say you might be at risk for developing cancer. So that's one of the challenges of are you going to be able to 
define what the cancer is and are you going to be able to define your treatment? Um, I'm not sure if I've answered that question well enough or not. So this is kind of a follow-up on sure. that question. Um, are genetic panels um, a good way to help provide precision therapies um, to control mechanisms of tumorigenesis? They are a start. Uh, the gen uh, genomic panels are a start for helping us define how we're going to treat the cancer. But uh, for many cancers, it depends on the cancer. For breast cancer, we're using it more in the recurrence rather than in the initial. For lung cancer and colon cancer, these tests are very important in the beginning for helping define what are the treatment options. So do they have microsatellite instability? Are they an ALK uh, positive tumor? So these are helping us better define what treatments we might use in the beginning. And there are even some cancers now, like some lung cancers, where we don't even use chemotherapy, but use some treatments defined by these genetics, uh, some very specific targeted antibody therapies rather than the traditional old-fashioned poisons. Okay. Um, another question we have, is the lung screening test recommended uh, for someone who lost part of their lung and may have nodules um, on there as well. They've already lost part of their lung from a cancer or from, if somebody's got the smoking history, then certainly they are still eligible to get the screening test, irrespective of uh, what's going on with lung. If they've already had lung cancer, there's slightly different guidelines for follow-up. Can you speak to tests like Signatera? Signatera is a company that is looking at blood tests, looking at screening for uh, right now, mostly recurrence of cancers. Um, they have some data on colorectal cancer. Uh, they have some data they're looking at on triple negative breast cancer to see if they may be able to detect uh, circulating DNA in the blood and uh, use that as a measure to maybe enhance screening. Uh, so it is something that is out there and is still sort of trying to find its, in my opinion, still trying to find the right place in the world to use it. But that's that kind of test that's coming down the pike that may give us some more guidance. Okay. Uh, I'm going to keep going here until they tell me to stop asking questions. Um, are there cancer screenings that 30 to 40 year old adults get as part of their routine checkups? Uh, 30 to 40 year old adults hopefully are exercising, not smoking, not drinking too much alcohol. For cancer screenings, uh, women will be getting uh, uh, gynecologic exams. Most 30 to 40 year old women do not need mammograms. Uh, for guys, uh, you do not need any routine cancer screening, but be aware of your body if you find lumps and bumps and things. Recognize that testicular cancer is most common in men between ages 15 and 35 or so, somewhere like that is the current range. And so there's not a regular recommendation about screening for testicular cancer but guys need to know if their body doesn't, uh, if it's got new lumps or bumps, but there's no mandated screening tools for that age group. Okay. I understand what a pap smear is, but what is an HPV test? And is the HPV test done during a pap smear? HPV, the virus test is done during the pap smear. Uh, yes. And it is basically just taking a sample of the fluid in the vaginal vault and it is sent to the lab and they are able to look for evidence of the presence of the virus. Okay. Can I get a virtual colonoscopy instead of the standard colonoscopy? You can. Uh, if you do a virtual colonoscopy, you still have to do the bowel cleanse to get your uh, bowel totally emptied of stool. Uh, the challenge with the virtual colonoscopy is um, you don't have to do the anesthesia, but if they do the virtual colonoscopy and they see something abnormal, then you have to go and get a real colonoscopy with the actual anesthesia and the tube. 
but not a real, you have to get the more invasive colonoscopy. Okay. Uh, and the last one here, if I am not a smoker, but have been exposed to secondhand smoke, should I be screened for lung cancer? Uh, not at this time. There are no guidelines for that right now. Okay. Um, well, that's all we have. Dr. Hagney, uh, it was such a pleasure having you join us for this discussion. My pleasure. Um, and for anyone watching, if you want more information about cancer screenings, uh, you can follow at VCU Massey Cancer Center on Facebook um, or visit Massey at MasseyCancerCenter.org. Um, once again, thank you very much, Dr. Hackney, and to all who joined us, have a great night. Thank you.